Hi, this is Annabelle Kay of Coffee Clutch, and this evening I'm being joined by the amazing Tristan Martin. I tend to think of you, Tristan, as the tech guy, not a tech guy, because I have to say you're the only person who ever talks to me about techie matters that I feel I can understand. Everybody else is like right over my head. So the subject of tonight's webinar is two things, and this has come out of the group and the support that Tristan's been offering inside our GDPR groups, and that is people don't get what is a VPN, what does it do, how do you set one up, what difference does it make? So that's one subject. And the other one I'm hoping we'll get to tonight is how to secure your Wi-Fi from people who log on as guests and do all sorts of stuff they shouldn't be doing. So I'm hoping we're going to get to to both Tristan, but um, these are really useful subjects because we have an obligation under GDPR to physically secure the personal data we handle, don't we? And, yeah. and this is part of that piece. Yeah, yeah it's there, there's a couple of areas too, which is where you're dealing with your the virtual private networks, which is what VPN stands for, um, and how your data transfers. But there's also been a lot of changes over the years of where the necessity of them are and what level of security they actually get versus what you might think they actually get. So uh, it's really, we'll go through um, and have a, a good look at uh, what would, the different areas you use it, where you're accessing the internet. And that's the biggest thing to consider is where are you when you're using the internet and you're transmitting that data and how are you transmitting that data? That's a very good question because Angela's just joined us from Tenerife, where she's probably using the hotel Wi-Fi. She's one of yeah. our GDPR members. I'm pretty sure she's not going to do anything on it she comes to regret. But even if we mostly work at home from a fixed point, it's not possible in the modern world never to log on from somewhere else, is it? No. Um, there's, there's certain things you can do. Uh, and again, it's also about reputation of the place. But there's also been a lot of changes that have been made over the, I suppose, the last sort of six to 10 years, well, probably the last eight years, where the security has increased by default, where we still do need or we still want to use VPNs, but the thing they're protecting us for, which is where everybody went to go and get one, actually it do, isn't needed for that for the VPN at the moment. The VPN has a, a different function that it actually provides for users, which I'll go into more in, in depth and in, in detail for people. But the security factor of the applications themselves has massively increased over the last eight years that keeps us very well protected so wherever we may be so can you start i mean i find the jargon and the acronyms that go with tech just do my head in you know? yeah. so people start talking about you know a, a vpn this this that and the other and everyone seems to know what they're talking about except for me so what is a virtual private network and why should so, i want one so a VPN, virtual private network, the idea is you're connecting to a network that you trust to access the internet. Now, this can give you a perceived uh, view or for anybody who's viewing you externally that you're coming from a different location. Um, so for instance, I'm, I'm gonna have to use a little bit of a whiteboard. So going back to some old tech and my uh, teacher mode, uh, what you tend to have is you've got, so I see you smiling on this one. So you've got where you are, um, your internet so this is where you're at home so you've got your internet at home and then when you're accessing a, a website you're accessing a computer that's on the internet or i'll just bring this around here you're accessing a computer that's on the internet through the internet and on this route there's lots of other computers that it will pass through your data goes through now when you're on your home internet and you're connecting to the uh, website you want uh, all the data transfers between these couple of computers. You know the data is what's happening on your home network. What the idea of a VPN is, if you're in a public internet, so you're on an internet that, or anywhere really, internet of public, with the VPN you have a, a, a network, so a, well, we'll call this a VPN. Your home internet connects to the VPN and then the VPN will connect up to the website. So as far as the website's concerned or the web server, all your traffic is coming from as if you're in that office there. So for instance, this could be used as 
if you wanted to, if you needed to connect to your, uh, let's say you're at, you're working from home, but you're work, you were employed by a large organisation, you might need to connect into their personal network as if you were sat inside their offices with your laptop plugged in via a cable using their Wi-Fi. So the VPN allows you to connect into their network, but when you use the internet, it goes out from that network to the rest of the internet. So this gives you the ability that if you were uh, in England, you could pretend to be in America because you connect to an American network, and that's where you get to view sort of the American Netflix and things like that. Because as far as Netflix is aware, when you're accessing it, so if that was Netflix, you're accessing it from a, a USA internet connection. You're not accessing it from a UK one. So and the other way, though, Tristan, what's really amazing is we've got lots of Americans in our uh, digital VIPs group. Yeah. And some of them use the VPN the other way around to simulate being in Europe so yeah. that they get to see what all the privacy options are that they're not getting. Exactly. And so as soon as you've got different, um, different sort of regions, it gives you the ability to pretend to be in one of those regions because the internet you get comes from the actual network you're joined to. Now, from a where they're properly set up would be a case of, let's say for a company like Michelin, uh, I used to work there in their IT department. If I wanted, if I was a home worker there, I might need to access internal files. So I would need to join their network, but I would need the data transferred from their network to my home to be secure. So the VPN, so the link to the VPN server here, it it actually encrypts all this data in a special sort of encryption, which means all the data is, connect, is protected between these two locations. So that means I can access the data that's within that network. So uh, if I was working at Michelin, I'd be able to access all the Michelin internal documents. But the side effect is if I'm accessing the internet, all the traffic goes through that way. So when, where the VPNs tend to get used today, or when they were first really pushed out by a lot of people as for home use, or sort of business use was when the hotspots started popping up, like as in the public ones, so in the coffee shops, in uh, McDonald's, in the hotels and things like that, because you wanted to make sure the data you're transferring between your computer and, say, the web server. So if you were logging into Facebook, you would used to log in on a HTTP website, which wasn't encrypted. So you would send your username and password straight out to Facebook, uh, through your home network, which you know and trust, the password wasn't encrypted. So if anybody in your home network was buying, they'd be able to see it. If you're in a public one, so like Costa, McDonald's, you have a reasonable sort of degree of their reputation. But if you're in a an unknown place, so maybe a, a hotel in Tenerife, maybe a, um, a, a sort of a little coffee shop that's using their own internet provision, you have no idea what's necessarily been installed and they could see. So the VPN would encrypt all your username and password that you were sending over to Facebook to log in. What's happened in the last eight years is pretty much everywhere, and it's Google's really pushed this, is you'll notice that when you go to Facebook, it's HTTPS at the beginning, which means all of the traffic you send is automatically encrypted. So even when you send it directly from your home without a VPN, it's encrypted. So your username and your password is protected already. Uh, and it's the same with things. There was a big discussion we had last time about Dropbox, whether it was encrypted or not. And it was the case of when it's sat on your computer, the files are not encrypted. When they're sat at Dropbox's server, they are encrypted. But when they send, when they transfer from your computer to Dropbox's server, they are encrypted. So that's using the internet uh, and that's making sure that the data as it transfers to the internet is encrypted because when you're accessing the internet, you've got your home computer, you've got wherever you might be going to, so let's say Dropbox, you've got essentially lots of other computers in between that it will go on the route to get to the destination. So this is where the internet was invented. So if one computer fails, we can still get to our destination. So I think around probably about four to six years ago, there is a there is the big transatlantic link. There's a big cable that runs from England all the way over the Atlantic to America. 
and it got severed by a, a fishing boat. They cut the cable in half as they were trawling. And so all of our traffic to America used to be going from England to Europe, uh, down through the European countries, down into Africa, across to South America and up into uh, USA. So when your internet goes, you will actually connect to lots of other computers in order to get to your destination. If the computers were um, maliciously set up, they can monitor whatever data passes between them. So if you went to sort of the file sharing uh, systems before encryption was sort of a thing, potentially any of the data as it passes through could be read. This is where the importance of having your encryption on emails with Dropbox, with OneDrive and all the other have come in. And Microsoft has sorted out OneDrive, Dropbox, or any big reputable company, all of the data is always encrypted as it is transferred. So it might sit on your computer not encrypted unless you enable encryption, but as soon as it leaves your computer to go onto the internet, it's encrypted till it gets to a destination and then however they store it is whatever the whatever they've told you. So when you're logging onto uh, Facebook uh, or when you go to any website, if you look at the top, you'll see whether it says HTTPS and secure, which means the data is encrypted as it passes, or it says HTTP, only that, and it, Google's starting to alert you now to say it's not secure, which means the so data- So that's what those warnings are about, the funny little messages you get when yeah. you go to a site that's not really up to date. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, with GDPR, especially as big, and Google's well ahead of this because they're making people do it because they're lowering your rankings in Google and they're also giving up this big message when you go to a website. Well, you're not going to feel safe on a website that has a big message that says not secure at the top. But the reason is most websites have a contact us form where you put in your name, your telephone number and possibly a message that might be personal. And if it wasn't through HTTPS, which mean, which is the secure layer of the web, it would just be open text that any one of these computers could actually read. And this is the same with email, because as it passes from the computers, which is where we talk about the email encryption. But email encryption doesn't mean the way that the enhanced part of Microsoft and Google Game have done. Your emails are already encrypted as long as they're set up correctly on your home computer with your web server. So um, that is what's known as uh, SSL, so secure socket layer. So you'll see, usually it's pretty much standard on most, whenever you set up your email account, Outlook or uh, whatever software you're using will tend to favor that one as the first choice if it's available. Uh, so pretty much all your data to its destination is already encrypted. But when you go back around eight years ago, it wasn't because it wasn't a standard. And that's when VPNs really started to get popular. They're more popular now for people to try and go, I want to be in America to watch the American Netflix shows. So for your home connections, you know where your data is transferring from. So you know everything inside that network because you know uh, your partner's computers, your kid's computers, you're responsible for what's there. You know there's nobody sat inside your network with their own little computer just monitoring all the traffic you're sending. So with your home one, a so VPN... I my partner's kid's computers have been hacked by something that's doing that because yeah. I'm not a techie, so obviously I wouldn't have organised anyone to do that. But I could well have a friend or family member on my Wi-Fi who's got some kind of thing in their computer they don't know about yeah. that's yeah. affecting the network, couldn't I? Yeah. The, your, for the monitoring of the data as it passes through the router, it tends to need to be something more active than sort of a, a virus on the computer. Um, we, there are other risks with uh, other computers on your network, and this is the second part of what the webinar is to go into, which is the, the secure Wi-Fi part. So I'll talk about that one uh, a bit later if I can put a pause on that. But, the, but when you're in yeah. your own home, you know who sat in there on, the most, on that most part. You know whether or not you buy your antivirus and you make sure every computer in your house has got antivirus on it to keep it protected. You know whether you've gone for the free option or you've paid for a paid for antivirus. And the, the best advice I would say to people is 
every company who produces a free antivirus software also produces a paid for one. So if the free one was as good as the paid for one, they'd never sell the paid for one. It's better than nothing, but the paid for one tends to have a lot more features to it, uh, which give better protections. So your- So would I need a VPN now? In what circumstances would you suggest I might want one? The, the biggest part I would say for a VPN is when you don't know the network, you can't trust how you're accessing the internet. So in your house, you know it's your network, so therefore you can trust it. <coughs> when you're using a hotspot, so like uh, Angela mentioned that she's using her 4G on her phone, there were that that's a hotspot. So with your iPhones, with your Android phones, you can turn them into personal hotspots. You might have bought a MiFi device, so a little sort of dongle or a little Wi-Fi router that allows you to access the internet when you're out and about, and it uses the mobile signal. Because you know the devices that are connected to it, it's your network, so therefore you can trust it. Because the the bits that are the the bits that VPNs would have encrypted previously are already encrypted. So your OneDrive, your Dropbox, your Google Drive, your emails, your logins to web pages, your logins to Capsule, your login, all those, any web page that has a login, as long as you're seeing that HTTPS and the secure padlock, you know the data between you and that destination is encrypted. If you're using an unknown data storage place, so, um, I, I don't know any off the top of my head, but if there is a, if there was one that you didn't know, it wasn't a big reputable company, then there's a chance it might not be encrypted, as in a transfer, and you'd have to check that out. You and that traveling abroad, yeah, yeah. I so find we've it's quite difficult to, to yeah. work out the security standards in traveling abroad because even yeah. if you get any information on them, it might not be in English. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I say. At the moment, I've, I've spoken. You can't about, always really tell for sure what you're logging into. Well, that, that's the main thing. So your home and your hotspots are your devices, so you know what you're connected to. When you go to a public hotspot, so this would be McDonald's, Costa, whether it's mm -hmm. in the UK or abroad, whether you're using a, a little coffee shop, whether you're using a hotel Wi-Fi, then there has to be the judgment of what's going on there. Now. I would split those into two categories, one which is reputable firms and the other which are people have just set up because we've got to give free Wi-Fi to everybody. So when you set up a Wi-Fi, and this is what I'll be talking about more for your homes as well or for your offices, you can you set there's a mode in there called uh, device isolation. So when you're when you've got your router and I'll go back to my uh, tech, you, when you've got your router, you've got it accesses the internet. So you've got the one part, which is your router. And your router part, the router goes out, which is what provides you with the internet. Okay, into your router, you've got some cable devices. So you might have um, a PC, another PC connected up. You've also got your wireless devices. So your wireless so that might be your laptop. Uh, you might have your iPhone. You might have uh, an iPad, all those wireless devices. Now, anything wired can always see each other. So because these two PCs will be able to go through and talk to each other as well as go out onto the internet. When you're in home, when you've got your home set up, you automatically have your Wi-Fi is by default set that everything is linked together. So actually, all of these devices can talk to each other and access to the Internet. What you can do is turn on what's called an isolation mode. And what the isolation mode does is isolates your Wi-Fi. So you've got these Wi-Fi coming into the router and one goes out to the Internet. The other one goes out to the Internet. So they all go out to the internet, but they can't talk to each other. So your iPad and your iPhone wouldn't be able to talk to each other. If you use the wireless backup on your laptop, they wouldn't be able to talk to your laptop to back up because they'd see the internet, but not the internal network. Um, so 
if you're in a in a reputable place that's spent will have spent a lot of money on their the free wi-fi that they offer so mcdonald's costa i'd probably say the very big hotels for definite so um your premier inns your travel lodges or your your larger sort of hilton hotels all of those they'll have everything completely separate because it's their reputation on it the so i'd probably still use a vpn then because i'm putting my faith in that of the company um I will say I've, I've been to a serviced office that is a council owned serviced office and the IT people there had actually made the entire network. Everybody could see everybody. So each office could see each other's printers. So while a reputable place is more likely to have got what's called the isolation, there's still a chance they might not have got it right. So I would use a VPN in that situation anyhow. But in principle, you shouldn't be able to see any other devices connected to the network. When you go to your the smaller sort of independent places, there's like, um, let's say a local coffee shop, they would have gone, OK, I need to offer Internet for my customers. So they'll buy the Internet like a residential person would do. They'll get their free router from BT, PlusNet, um, Sky or whatever, talk, talk. They will plug that in and they will say, this is the Wi-Fi password. And you'll use that just as if you're inside your house. And inside your house, all of your devices talk to each other. And that's where you definitely need the VPN, because you don't know that the person sat on the opposite table isn't monitoring all the traffic in the router before it goes out. Now, again, most of it should be encrypted, but you never know what they're doing. So the VPN gives you an extra layer of security, because what it does is says all the traffic that you're sending out is put through a tunnel so no one can see inside there they can't see any of the ones and zeros it's all encrypted therefore you've got that extra layer of security and that's what the vpn offers because until you get to that virtual network you've subscribed to all your data is completely encrypted so even if you sent it as a text so let's say you had unencrypted emails or you were using a, um, a cloud storage system where there was no encryption it will be encrypted on the transfer between you and who you've bought your VPN off. So you could buy VPNs from, I think, Norton, McAfee. Uh, there's a lot of them that sell it, and it will be their servers. There's a lot of independent ones out there. Again, it's a trustworthy factor because it's their network you're joining. So you need to know you can trust their network, uh, which is, again, where you look at the reputation of the company. On a, on a main point, uh, not many companies would exist if their reputation wasn't there, if they couldn't offer what everybody else offers. Um, so that's that's the case where the VPN really is needed, is the public Wi-Fi, because you don't know how those people have set it up. You know how your home network is, and you know who's on your home network. You know your own hotspot, because you turn the hotspot mode on on your phone. What you don't know is on a public one, how have they set it up? Less likely to be at risk in the big reputable places, still potential because you haven't seen it, you don't control it. The little independent places, there's a very good chance all you've got is the equivalent of what you've got in your home, but then you're sharing that network with a bunch of strangers. You have no idea who they are, what they're capable of doing and what they are doing. So that's where your, your VPN is, is that public internet access. So if you're traveling with a laptop, yeah. you, you really do need to consider a VPN if you've got yeah. GDPR covered data that you're using for work. It, because the, the mobile data rules are changing all the time. If you've got a package that, so I think uh, Angela was saying she's using her 4G hotspot. So she's still using her internet to access anything she needs to do. So if I was watching this webinar, um, on uh, and I was uh, abroad, I wouldn't be worried about using the Wi-Fi because what is the data I'm transferring right now while well, I'm looking at a video of two people telling me about VPNs. If I was going to do some work for a client, then I'd definitely be using a VPN. If I'm using my internet, because it's my internet, that's where I know my security is there because the only people on my network is me. So that's when, so the VPN is really when you're using someone else's network that you don't know you can trust. And you can only really 100% trust.
trust your own. So that's where you, you time from. So if you are going to use a hotel's Wi-Fi and you are going to do work for a client, you're going to be accessing your emails. Again, on the most part, things are encrypted because the data is transferred. So using your emails and that, but the VPN just gives you that added extra bit of security. That's really good to know. Now, Angela raised a question in the earlier part of, of your conversation, which was, OK, we, we understand now about HTTPS websites, but some sites still don't have the S. We're still no. coming across sites. What's your recommendation then? Is there anything you I mean, can do? Should you not use them at um, all or use them and not put in data? What's you if you know that the most sites again it's it's that sort of reputation part any big company will have done that there's no real excuse for any website to not have a secure part so when you type in your http this is it's it is a bit more work for yourself because i would say type it in yourself if i ever i see on a lot of design parts they say what's your web address and i am a very fastidious person on this because I will be HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www. And I go, well, why are you putting the HTTPS at the beginning? Everybody knows that. In fact, you shouldn't even have the www there. But for me, that's the proper way of writing it. So if I'm going to a website, I will tend to write in the HTTPS. So if you, you have two parts on a website you go to, if you go to HTTP colon forward slash forward slash and then start typing in the www dot and the rest of it, that will bring up the unsecured version. Now, if you're, and this is something that would be beneficial for you to look at on your own website, so go to your own websites, type in HTTP and the web address. If you can view your website with HTTP, Google Chrome will just turn that into www dot whatever your website is. It will get rid of the HTTP. That means, your unsecure version of your website is viewable. If you type in, hey, uh, what should happen, sorry, is what that should automatically get forwarded to HTTPS, colon, forward slash, forward slash. So if you go to any sites that I host, for instance, you can never access the HTTP version. It automatically turns into HTTPS because for anything that I put onto my server, it automatically forwards to that. So that version is inaccessible, inaccessible to anybody who comes to it. The, the, if you do go to a site that's got, that allows the HTTP version to happen, one, I drop them a message to say, you do know you've still got that unsecure, but it doesn't mean they haven't got a secure version of the site. It just means potentially they haven't got that forwarding happening. So, and you can do this, I'll put a, if you go to my website, I'll put two links into the message part, the HTTP and the HTTPS. You'll notice if you go to the HTTP, it forwards onto the HTTPS. You cannot view the insecure version. What I I'm would- I'm still coming across people in groups, Tristan. I was in a group thing yesterday where someone said, what is all this HTTPS? Why is my website showing up with an unsecure message from Google? That was the website owner who 48 hours ago still had no idea. So there are yep. obviously a lot of sites out there that are not. There are. Google's been talking about this for years. Um, and Google, it I think it should have come in by now, is going to have in, where it says secure at the top in the Google Chrome, it's going to actually say not secure if you go to a non-HTTPS uh, non site. So hopefully to get people the message. It's not just individuals. There are big companies. There is a... Uh, there's a franchise that out there that uh, I know of that I spoke um, to one of the franchisees to, and they contacted the franchisor and they said, oh yeah, there's going to be no big deal about it. There, there are people just ignoring it. And okay, you might not have a login, you might not ask a person to type in their username and password, but you are still collecting some personal data that you're, at, as soon as they click submit, it's in your control. You are processing that data. So you do have a responsibility for it. Chances of it being hacked, as in one of those computers en route viewing the data, very, very low. But the so in practical terms, is it going to cause that much of an effect that, that you would have a data breach? It's a very low risk. The biggest risk for yourselves is Google will lower your rankings to the bottom. 
any if someone searches for let's say a VA as this is a VA group, uh, group every VA who has a HTTPS website will go above yours yours will be at the bottom and now with Google Chrome's other change when anyone go to your website will automatically say not secure now that's going to immediately put people off because they're going to go I'm going to a website that's saying not secure uh, even though it might be that you don't even have a contact us form on there. SSL certificates cost nothing. You can pay for them, but you only the ones you pay for are the ones where if you go to a PayPal's website, you'll see PayPal in the green. Instead of it saying secure, it'll say PayPal. So those are the ones you pay for, for it to give a, a branding to the security. If I was dealing with uh, credit card transactions, then yes, I'm going to pay for my certificate. If I'm just if I've just got a simple contact us form, or I don't even have that, I will use the free one, which is called Let's Encrypt. The encryption is both as secure as each other. The paid for ones tend to be a bit more encrypted, but it's I suppose it's the equivalent of having a Ferrari in, and living in London. You're never going to get over 30 miles per hour. So, is there any point of having a Ferrari in London? Oh, absolutely. The guys seem to think so, don't they? Well. But um, we won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> but, there, but that is the, the same principle. You know, if you've got 256-bit uh, encryption, do you need 1,024? It's a nicer security, certainly to be able to say you've got it, but is it going to offer anything more than the 256-bit? And uh, ICO statement on encryption is you will use what is standard technology. That, so, I mean, if you went to sort of uh, government levels of encryption, it's way higher than that. So, what do you need it for? If I was doing credit card transactions on my website, so I was actually processing them and not sending them out to Stripe or PayPal or one of the other companies, if I was processing them on my server, then yes, I'd want to pay because I'd want to have that extra bit of security. If I'm just having a website that might have a contact us form or even nothing like that, then the standard HTTP, the standard SSL is perfectly fine. You might be charged an admin fee for your web developer to turn it on, but it is literally a tick, enter. If they say it's not possible, their web server is already over six years out of date. So, so you have to get your site toasted somewhere I'm else anyway. Server, yeah. If, yeah. Because Let's Encrypt has been around for six years, because I've certainly been offering it for six years, and even if I was on old hardware, I'd have, I would be on the latest version of the Plesk um, web server or whichever cPanel or whichever one I was using, and they would automatically include it because Let's Encrypt has become a standard because everybody needs it because your website will drop on Google if you're not encrypted. So, uh, Brilliant. Sorry, I'm going to take a deep breath because we didn't mean to go down HTTPS no. in, in, in a big way. And so we're coming to the second half of our webinar. So we're about to switch through to securing your Wi Fi. But I've got a question from the room which might be long in the second bit or it yeah. might be a kind of linky bit because I don't know enough about the tech to know where it sits. So Angela said she had a question for later. If she's Bluetoothing from an iPhone to a PC, so we're really talking about Bluetooth now. Does that yeah. come under Wi-Fi or where is it? Is right. it secure to Bluetooth? I mean, all this technology exists. I don't really, is Bluetooth just radio? <laughs> right. So you, your way of connecting to your internet, so you, you've got your internet part. So connecting to the internet requires a modem. So a lot of you will have a, a box, something like this, that you've got from the internet provider. Inside this is several bits of kit. The first bit, which is what gives you the internet, is the modem. Okay, so the modem is what's called a modulator demodulator, and it was it's called a modem even though it's not a, technically a modem anymore because when you used to have your old dial-up systems, so that's when you'd have your phone and it was all engaged and you'd be having a phone number that your computer dialed and then you'd have the those squeak noises which was a handshake and then you. I remember COVID protocols, but let's not go there. <laughs> but when you had that, what it was doing is your telephone was an analog line and your computers were digital. So that's what the modem did, was turn the digital into analog, and at the other end, the analog into digital. We call it a modem, so therefore we've stuck with the term, even though everything now with ADSL, fiber, virgin internet, it's all digital. So there's not the translation needed, but there's still a piece of kit that goes between 
the internet as it comes into the property and the rest of your network. So that's your modem. That has the only job of connecting you out to the internet. The other thing you've got in here is what's called a switch. And the switch is that part where you've got those. These are where all your devices can talk to each other. OK, so if you've um, got if you've been into a, a big sort of corporate environment and seen their network, you'll probably have seen some sort of panel up on the wall with lots of cables in. That's a switch that allows all the devices to talk to each other. So these four devices I can plug in here, will talk in to the Internet and come out, which would be through this because this is uh, so it will come out to the Internet that plug. Your other part that you've got built in here is the Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi does exactly the same as these, except it uses a wireless signal. Now, so all of those connect in. It's just a communication method. So Bluetooth is exactly the same as Wi-Fi, as in it's a communication method. It allows two. It's like um, a language that two devices, a protocol, that two devices can talk through and understand. Um, if you try to use your phone on your TV, it won't change the channel because unless your TV is Bluetooth. Your TV is expecting infrared. And if you go back old enough, you'll have some laptops that had infrared receivers on there. You could have infrared keyboards and devices that you could control your computer with on a distance. It needed line of sight, like your TV and a remote does. But the communication method, whether it's wireless, cabled, um, Bluetooth, infrared, or whatever else you might have, is uh, between an A to B. So in other words, getting from your device to your router so they all have their own advantages and disadvantages so for instance if you're cabled you can be up to 1000 megabits per second of data so really fast if you're on wi-fi you probably for most people have a, a top speed of around 300 megabits per second of data so if you're on wi-fi and you've got the top speed of virgin then you're just about able to make full use of it. If you don't have a good quality Wi-Fi, so if you've got their sort of bare basic box, you could well have a 300 megabit speed, but actually if you only had one computer in the house connected wirelessly, you'd only ever be able to maximum use 200 megabits of it. So you'd never make, sure, make use of the other 100. If you had two computers in the house, both using it at full speed, then you'd have 150 each. So you'd be able to do it because it'd be under the 200. So those it's where you get your Wi-Fi and your connection. So when you buy your, your stock routers that you get are worth probably around 20 quid, if that, uh, that the internet providers give you. If you go and look at routers on uh, Amazon, you'll see they can go up to 350 pounds. Again, if the 350 pounds was exactly the same as the 20 pound one, they'd never sell a 350 pound one. They're not. You'll notice all the way through the wireless speed differs and the quality of service differs in the features they have. So um, my personal recommendation is if you can, I would always replace that stock router you get from your internet provider. Keep it as a backup, don't ever chuck it because if there's ever a line fault, they'll blame your router. But I would always upgrade to a, a better quality router. So. Tristan, you're, you're so amazingly confident. I don't know if it's just me, and I'm going to fess up. Right? I have never used a router other than the one that the people sent me. Yeah. I wouldn't know if I got another one yeah. what to do with it. I mean, yeah. I, I struggle if I have to reboot my own um, hub yeah. with which That's... of all the invisible buttons do I press that does something. I would never have the confidence to... Yeah. Um, that is the downside of going for your own router, which would be finding probably someone who is local uh, to do the setup. Potentially it can be talked through, but that's also getting to know your device, which is where we talk about the Wi-Fi security. It is about actually having a little look through. So, um, but we've got to have a habit of doing that. Uh, if you if you go back, uh, probably uh, my parents' generation, uh, if they bought a car, they would know how most of the parts works. They'd be interested into it. They would get into it and have a look at it. Myself, I've got a car. No one in my family has ever opened the boot of a car for four generations. Um, we have bought and sold cars you've never opened the bonnet on. That's the, what mechanics do. Uh, yeah, uh, and I'm exactly the same sort of viewpoint there. I, even my oil, I will have quickly check my oil. 
Um, yeah. I, I'm not interested in the car in the slightest, but we we do get out of that habit because of part of a throwaway society where, well, if it doesn't work, we chuck it, we'll buy a new one. We we don't get into some of the, the what we could actually probably fix quite easily because it's just easier to buy a new one. Um, and again, the same with your router. There's a lot of options you have in it, but they're not turned on by default. There's, uh, if you've got kids, there's uh, filtering built into a lot of them. The secure well, tell me a little bit about that, because I was saying to someone the other day, and I know it's not the subject of our webinar, really, and maybe you should do a parent's securing yep. your internet thing for people. Because I said, when my kids were of an age when what they saw on the internet was my business, I mean, they're 30 now, so they wouldn't thank mum for turning on any filters. Um, we, we actually had dial up an AOL, and there used to be parental controls in that. And you could say, you know, this is the level of graphic, whatever, this is the level yeah. of, and they used to filter the site. So are you saying that it's possible within a Wi-Fi booter to do that? So all these worried parents go to my kids going to watch porn at 3 a.m. could fix that. Depending on what you've got given. And this is where I would possibly look at either having someone who's maybe local to yourselves to have a look at your, your internet, or um, you can do some things remotely. Uh, it sometimes can be easier um, to look at the, have someone who's locally to, to go in there. It's probably one of the only jobs I tend to do that needs, that nine times out of 10 needs me to be present. I could probably do it remotely. I'd rather not um, because you can't be remote until you've actually put in the new details. So your broadband username and password into this device. So you'd buy a, a router so from wherever, uh, Amazon PC World, and you'd plug your laptop in through a cable, and then you'd have access, you'd, it, would, it has a wizard built in, most of them, that would actually ask you, what is your broadband username, what is your broadband password, and it would set it all up for you. A lot of them are really nice and easy to do. But depending on the router you've got, they have all different features, and that's what you tend to be paying for. You can have some which have, um, the parental filters and you, you'll see it'll be like a web page you'll load up a web page and you can do this on your own routers that you've got if you look at, pick up your router what you'll find is you'll have a label on it and on that label you'll usually see so in this one uh it is right there so just above my finger hopefully you can sort of make out a bit on that um it says there a web address to go to typically you'll see it'll say something like 192.168 uh, sorry, 192.168.0.1 or 1.1 1 .1 or it might end in 254. That is the web, that is the physical location of the router on your network. You type that into the web bar at the top and it will ask you for a username and password and they're typically written on the box. You can change them, but that's what's on the box, which is not too bad to, to sit on the window showing out because they need to be plugged into one of these. The trouble is if you have your Wi-Fi password on there as well, and you've not changed that, then if they can connect to your Wi-Fi, they can then get into the settings. When you've logged in through your web browser, you will see a screen which is just a menu screen. So it's like going into the menu on your TV. And it will have, there'll be an internet section, there will be a wireless section, there will be possibly filter section, there might be a, a port forwarding section, there will be sort of the main menu um, and don't change anything but if you click on the menu options you can just see what they allow and you can see the text there so for instance it's a bit like when you go on to if you do on your tv and you go through the menus you'll see you can change all the sound settings you can change the picture warmth you don't necessarily change any of it but it's nice to see what you could potentially change so your wireless part is where you can set up your wireless password so a lot of the time you'll stick to the wireless password that comes on the little card with the box that you've taken out uh, and it's typically on the back of the router that if you put that in the window like that people your posty or anyone coming to the door can actually see um, that gives the wireless away you if you change the password to something you like you know what the password is and you never have to root for that card to go yes it's this uh, is small x capital f five capital g no you don't have to deal with that you can go this is the password or this is the passphrase but you also see under the wireless whether there's an option called guest wi-fi and the idea of a guest wi-fi is 
if you have people over to your house, so friends, family, uh, other family, your kids' friends, clients, they'll typically say, oh, can I use your internet? And winner, well, of course you can. Here's the password. And you pass them the card. At that moment, they are on your network. And as I mentioned before with the, the one picture where all your devices are talking to each other, if they're on your network, their laptop, their phone, their tablet, can see your laptops, your phone, your tablet. And on the most part, you're probably fine. But you don't know their tech. You don't know if they have antivirus or not, whether they care about it or not. You don't know if they just randomly open every single attachment that comes in on their email. But they are on the same network as your computers. So if you have a virus, that let's say it's a brand new zero day virus, and your computer's not protected against it yet, that virus can go, oh, I can see your computer and get in. Because antivirus is uh, reactive, uh, yeah, reactive until the antivirus, the antivirus companies know that the virus exists and have worked out how to detect it, your antivirus doesn't know it exists. And then they will work out how to cure it. And then your antivirus can fight it. And so a brand new virus that comes out, which is where you'll hear the term zero day, is brand new out. No one knows anything about it. And that's where it really spreads. The other part is if you don't keep your computers up to date, your Windows update, uh, which is where the NHS got hit last year in, uh, when they had were hit with the ransomware. The bug that was exploited was patched in March by Microsoft. But because it's a big organization like the NHS, they can't just do Windows updates because it could knock out all the system. But three months later or four months later, they still hadn't put that patch into place. So the, there was an exploit that was found out that was used by the ransomware. One computer in the NHS got infected, whether it came in by email or anything like that, it got brought inside the network. That one computer could see all the other computers inside the network. So therefore, when the person ran the program, it looked on the network to say, is there anybody who can be exploited with this exploit? Is there anybody who hasn't got it patched? Anyway, oh, that computer, that computer, that computer, that computer. And it just spread throughout the entire network. Because once it got into those computers, it said, can we see any computers that we can? Do? So suddenly, instead of one trying to talk to half a dozen, you then got seven of them trying to talk to each of those to half a dozen, which then got spread on to and spread on. So you ended up with it wiping through the entire network so quickly. So if you've got a friend who comes over, and they're connected to your Wi-Fi, what do they have on their devices? And are yours 100% up to date? And even if they are, there's still that risk that they've had something from that is brand new released as a virus that you don't know about, or something malicious that you don't know about, or your computers don't know about it. The, um, the other part is, if someone's on your Wi-Fi and you fall out with them, and this is probably typically more kids because they will lose friends uh, and their friends will all go off in a huff and it, it might take a week for them to remake the friendship but they can access your internet two houses down or a house down uh, it'd be interesting take your phone out of your house and walk down your street and see how far you get till you lose your wi-fi signal and that's how far I've got great for that just uh, i live uh, uh, two doors away from a really great coffee shop yeah. and if I want to work in the coffee shop I work on my Wi-Fi yeah well that's I, the thing I can it's still it. do it there because yeah. the, the yeah, signal gets that far if I go to the next coffee shop I can't do it so yeah. uh, there's only one place to get my coffee well, that, that's the thing. Have a look how far you can go. You can see everybody else's Wi-Fi in your street uh, because you'll see all their names come up when you do scan the networks to find yours. So if you can see theirs, they can see yours. So, again, if anybody uses your Internet, you're liable for whatever happens on your network. So uh, let's go for a nice simple uh, thing. Someone could be someone, uh, a client, um, a kid's friend, something like that could be a person who loves downloading music 
they sit outside in the car or they sit outside with their device streaming whatever that may be illegal content is coming through your internet even though they're two houses down while they're collecting it okay how likely is it they can do that there have been occasions where i've known a few businesses where they've had people park up outside because i've had the guest wi-fi or a free wi-fi and done that so that comes through your internet so you're liable for that worst case scenario they access something that's severely illegal and then gets a police investigation that's your internal equipment confiscated while they investigate so if they went for let's say indecent images of children that's your equipment that has to be taken away to investigate to say okay you didn't do it because the track back will be to your home's internet now we still want to be able to say to our friends our family which we would never expect anything like that to come from you can use our internet we may even still say to clients when they come in to if you're working from home yes of course you can use our internet because they might need to show you something or they might need to get something on their laptop the the problem comes to you will never change your wi-fi password and the reason you'll never change your wi-fi password is because of the hassle it causes you changing your wi-fi password in your house means you've got to update your tv every games console that you might have with your kids your tablets your phones your laptops your other pcs uh depending on how uh, into your tech you are maybe your coffee machine maybe your kettle um everything single device it might be that you have to change your sound system because that connects via wi-fi it could be your lightings in your house if you have to change your wi-fi password you have to suddenly go through all of these devices and change the password in them and some of them aren't so simple so like your amazon echo you have to go into a special app to get into there so your printers don't have the ability to type it in so you have to redo the i'll press a button there and dash over and press a button over here all of those things that are wirelessly connected that you've done once as soon as you change your password you have to do it all over again so the idea is you have a guest wi-fi and that's the thing you look for in your router because your guest wi-fi is a second wi-fi for starters they're not on your network uh once you, they're not on your network if they get a virus it cannot talk to your computers they can access the internet they will be in what's called an isolation mode so that they can access the internet but they can't see let's say you have two guests over the two guests can't talk to each other but they can access the internet uh and then the separate part is the you can change that password because you can change it daily you could change it weekly so you can minimize any risk of anybody sat outside your house or anything like that or if you fall out with someone or you have a disagreement you know they can't do anything because you've changed the password when you've changed your guest wi-fi password you still haven't changed your internal home password so all your devices your printers your consoles your tv your uh, amazon fire genius they're the same but you can change that password every single day and the only people you're going to annoy are your guests which don't have an entitlement to your internet oh yes this is my password of the day and for kids that's the password that you give them because they haven't done their chores so they don't get to know the daily password kids will know and i mean this is just going to a teacher parenting sort of point kids will know you'll never change your home wi-fi password so you can never threaten it because it will cause you as the parent too much disruption and you've got to update all those devices with a new password you're never going to do it willy-nilly but if it's your guest one you can change that every single hour if you like and you don't affect yourself you affect the guests and Brilliant. You can be truly... yeah you 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 can and that do, probably um... explains why some of the hotels and places i've been um, where they actually have a guest Wi-Fi log on. And I always yep. thought it meant because I'm the guest, but actually it, it's structurally different to the, the, the used to run the hotel. Yeah, because all the hotel computers will need to talk to each other. If they're isolated, they can't communicate. So you won't be able to print, they won't be able to... So they need all the Wi-Fi for one network, which is the business network. And then your guest one is a separate one. Um, depending on the setups you have, you can potentially have up to four off on any one device. But again, it depends on the router you buy. Um, for most home ones, I'd be looking at an £80 router, which is the Netgear D6400 is the one I recommend for home. If you want something with an extra bit of pizzazz, 
the, uh, it's around 130 pound which is the d7000 from netgear they're both very good very full of features um that are absolutely brilliant as as routers go and they were and they will work whether you're using virgin internet or whether you're using um adsl uh, from bt sky or fiber or anything you chuck at them they will work so if you are someone who swaps between providers they'll work on all providers even if you swap over to virgin and then back to bt and then to virgin and it will just work. So are any of the hubs that providers provide, like Virgin or BT, capable of having a guest network, or do you have to buy your own router to get that to, far? Yeah. Virgin's latest router, now I don't know if it's business only, but their latest router does have a guest Wi-Fi on. And you actually see on the back of it four Wi-Fi passwords. Um, two are for the house, two are for guests. Uh, because there's a split between what's called gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And that's just, again, a communication frequency. Uh, 2.4 has a maximum of around 30 megabits per second as data, whereas 5 gigahertz can handle up to 1 gigabit per second of data transfer. Um, the And, of course, they give the old version because, let's say, you've got an old device in your house, that like uh, an iPhone 3, it can't talk on 5 gigahertz. So they have to give you both frequencies but you'll have the password for your home and you'll have a password for the guest and i think with and the Virgin, Melinda says she's got a separate guest login with a code that only lasts for 60 minutes and what so, i'd like to know more is what what route are you using yeah, to do so that, again, that, that could be that's again going to be a feature of that specific router uh which again can be a, a nice great feature uh, but that will depend on the router you've got, um, whether it's something you brought yourself or whether that's something that came from the internet provider. Uh, there are some internet providers that have got routers that should have a guest Wi-Fi and they've actually disabled it. Uh, I've come across a few of those. They've actually, because they put their own firmware on there, they've actually disabled some of the functionality that it would have. Uh, BT, I know the business, latest business hub comes with it. I don't know about the home one. I've not seen it. Uh, so you have to go in and have a look. If you are on a, a, if you, there's a number of the providers that will say, well, yeah, we'll give you a premium router for a bolt-on fee. If you're going to pay for the bolt-on fee, you may as well just buy your own because you know it's yours and it can be used wherever you like. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, Maureen, uh, you said, as you said, it's commercial router from your IT people. So in other words, you've, you've had your own special router got, which has got a great feature onto it. So is this something I should be bold enough to tackle? Um, it's, it can be. There's a lot of guides out there. All you need is your use, is your internet username and password. And most of the time you've got given that when you signed up. Uh, the BT home, the BT hubs are generally quite good, but they don't have the guest Wi-Fi unless the latest model does. But again, go into it and have a look. Uh, depending on your provider, some of them will, some of them won't. That's why I say, Look on the back, go into the console, the admin thing, and have a look at what settings are there. So you don't go have into to the console, you've been plugging your laptop to it and have a uh, look. No, if you're connected to it, you'll see on the back uh, the address to go to. It will say something along the lines of your... Uh, you lost me. I'm sorry to be a dog. How do I get connected to my admin console? Right. So what you'll have is on the back of the router, it will tell you uh, admin access or something like that. You'll see a HTTP web address. So typically it might have a name on it. So like with this one, it says router login. Uh, on um, other ones, it will have an IP address. So the 192.168. something. Uh, and all you do is you type that in. So on your web browser, so Google Chrome Edge, you've got the big long white bar at the top. So this isn't a search. This is I know where I'm going. So you type it in at the top where it normally would say HTTP and the web address. You type in. 192.168. and press enter. It will ask you for the admin password, username and password, which again is on the back of the box. Type that in, you've got access. Uh, and you'll and it will just load it up because it's all a web page. So everything's ah. done in the web browser. Oh, sorry to be dim, but I couldn't work out how on earth I was supposed to get into it. <laughs> so you, you just use your web browser, whether you like Edge, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Opera, whichever one you like, but you're not searching. You don't type it into the Google search. 
you type it into the address bar at the top. So um, the way I used to explain this to kids is if I was, if I've told you where to go, the web address to go to, you type it in. If I've asked you to find me some information about VPNs, you type in to search for VPNs. And it's the same as a, a sort of using your sat nav. If you know where you're going, you will type in the address you want to go to. Uh, you so if I've logged in, Tristan, and what am I looking for to find out whether I've got guest access or not? What so sort of language would it be? You're, yeah, on a, when you go in, you'll see a, pay, a, link, uh, a number of menu options. The wireless section is the one you go to, and you'll see the wireless, and it will tell you your password, which means you can change your password, and you'll usually see guest Wi-Fi, or you won't. If it's there, it will often be unticked. There'll be a little box that says, like, enable guest Wi-Fi. Tick it. Your guest Wi-Fi is enabled. You'll see that it has a different name. So, for instance, if your Wi-Fi name was, let's say, um, a Virgin router would have a VM and then a bunch of numbers, you'll probably find the guest one will say VM, the same bunch of numbers, dash guest. So that is the name of your network, of the Wi-Fi. And then you'll have somewhere where you can type in the password and you can just set that up. Every router is different. So um, I would probably have a look again on the back. It will usually tell you your make and model. Type that in and the word guest Wi-Fi. You'll find YouTube videos that will show you. You'll find uh, guides all over the place that will show you. But for the first part, don't change it if you're not sure. Go and just have a look. As long as you don't click OK, you're clicking cancel if you do make any changes, or you just close the browser, you're not changing anything on your internet. But you can have a look through the menu, just like you will with the remote for your TV, and you'll just see, what can I change? Oh, that I could tune that in. I'm not doing it, but I could do. I can change the picture one thing. Just have a look through the menus so you can see the options that are available. Because when you see the options, they're there, they're designed to make it easy for you to do. And you'll suddenly see, oh, I can do filters. So it's OK. I've got a Netgear, what's this one? Um, uh, da, 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 a Netgear WNR834B. And it says I can do filtering. So I'm going to type into Google Netgear WNR834B filtering. And there'll be guidance out there how you can make use of it. Um, again, you can talk to an IT guy, a uh, lady sort of close to you to go through. A lot of those things can be done remote. It's the changing of the router that you tend to preferably have somebody who's local to you. Now, we've got another very techy person in the room, Derek, so I think one from our trainer GDPR group. And he's yeah. saying he tends to restrict his home router by device MAC address. Now, that's way above my pay grade. Yeah. What does so, that mean? Every network device has a unique code to it. There's, um, it's called a MAC address, and it's usually it's about six pairs of characters. So it's between zero and nine, and A to F, uh, which is the hexadecimal um, counting system. So you've got, I think it's six pairs. It might be eight pairs. Uh, let me have a look. Is it on here? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yes, uh, six pairs. So uh, on this one, it's that there. Every device has a unique given one. Now, yes, they can be spoofed, as in pretend you can use software to pretend to be something different. But what that does is you are physically saying this device is allowed to connect to the Wi-Fi. Um, it depends on your setup and what you want to achieve by it. By having a password, you don't tend to need it because the trouble you've got is if you do want to add a new device, you've got to go in find its MAC address, add that to the allowed list, and then get it to do connection with the password. That'll be about two uh, months' work in this house which, because of the which, sheer number of and gizmos, time. gadgets, and things that want to. And it does also mean that if you, and depending on your route, you might be able to do MAC address reservate, uh, for the house, and the guest Wi-Fi might be available to be without it. But if you are ever having guests on there, you've then got to always go into the router and add a new device in. If somebody has a, a, a you come home with a new device, you've got to go in and do that before you can allow it on. So it, it was good before the passwords were so strong. There used to be a passphrase method that had a huge amount. You had to type in about several passwords to get in. So it's far easier to leave your Wi-Fi non-password protected and just use a MAC address. Uh, but we're going back to about 2002. 
if you've got it right, if you've got a wireless password now and you and you'll see in the modes, it's called WPA2, which is the standard. Um, you don't really need that because you're in charge of who you give your password out to. Uh, it can be very good if you own if you didn't have a guest Wi-Fi and you did want to restrict your kids' access. But again, you have to go in and enable, disable. So you constantly have to go in and change the settings. So if I go back to my TV analogy, it would be like, okay, on I, every time I load up, I, while I'm watching my TV, I'm having it in warm mode. Now I'm loading up my game console. I'm going back in and I'm changing it to game mode. Oh, and now I'm loading up uh, my Netflix and warm mode doesn't quite suit it. So I'm going to change it. So it would be changing your menu settings every time you're changing your channel. Sounds it's like a lot of work. It is a lot yeah. of hard work. Uh, from, but if it's something you prefer to do, do it. If you like it, do it. And if it works for you, I'm never going to say yeah. to someone, if it works for you and you're happy with it, then stay with it because you've got yourself into a routine. For somebody who doesn't tend to do it, um, I wouldn't necessarily bother. Have a password. Have your two Wi-Fi's on there because, again, it's only one box, two Wi-Fi's. One is your main one one is your guest one and your guest one you can just change that password as much as you like you probably find you'd only change it every month uh again and but again it depends so for instance where i am i i'm in my office of my va so i have a, i rent an office from my va and the wi-fi we set up there we have a guest one for their training room and we personalize it every single time there's a guest that comes in so it, it adds a nice little bit of an extra for them so if they had a cook so let's say i was uh, renting the training room off them then the Wi-Fi would include the name Tiao Martin. And it's a nice little touch that we give to anybody that comes in. But we change the password regularly so nobody knows what the staple one is in between because anybody who's coming in to use the guest Wi-Fi, it's already been personalized for that organization that's coming in. So, you, you know, there's nice little touches and things you can do with it, but you can just change the password so no one can ever be set out. You might even find with some routers, you can actually set time zone, time limits on it. So again, where I am here, we know we're in the office till eight o'clock at night. Uh, obviously, I'm here till nine tonight. But I was the, guest say, that one <laughs> the guest Wi-Fi turns off at eight o'clock. So when there's nobody in the office, there's no guest Wi-Fi. So no one can ever be sat outside while no one's here. You, if they knew the guest Wi-Fi password and ever using it, because the actual turns off so again with kids you can set their wi-fi times that they're allowed to use it um if you if you buy if you have one of the routers which tend to be the draytech models that will have four wi-fi's built in uh some of the other ones do as well um but you can set time zones for them so you could actually have a wi-fi for the house or for the business a so you could make the kids not be on the internet all night by giving them That's, their own unique, yeah you can um, turn off their wi-fi during certain hours yeah, uh, but it, so when it, they go to bed, the Wi-Fi kills at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, so they're not up all night. Well, um the, only their Wi-Fi. Uh, when I was teaching, we, there was a police officer that came in to give parents um, some guidance on their safety. And the one thing that had me as a head, uh, bang my head on the wall as soon as he said it was, when the kids go to bed, to stop them accessing the internet, turn off your router. Well, I'm thinking if I send my son to bed at 7.30, I'm not going to be not able to access Facebook or Netflix or something. I'm dis I'm I watch TV for the router. Yeah, yeah, I hardly ever so watch any real... It's also a bad life. thing to do because if you yeah. turn off your router regularly, the internet thing, your internet provider thinks you've got a, a bad signal and therefore it lowers your speed. And then when you ring up to complain that your speed's really slow, they'll go, well, you, you can't handle a higher speed. And then when they find out it's because you've turned your router on and off every day, you're the person to blame. They have to reset everything and it just causes disruption. But having a separate Wi-Fi that you can turn on, you, even if you don't have that as an option, the more expensive ones, you can buy additional Wi-Fi devices, uh, a different Wi-Fi access point that you could just set up to be filtered for their devices. So they have their own password for their Wi-Fi and they can be filtered they can be you can have a report of what they're accessing and you can actually set times and things and all it is is an, oh, another one just plugs into there and so you end up with you your house wi-fi and your guest wi-fi and then the kids wi-fi and there's all sorts absolutely of brilliant tristan now you very kindly offered us an hour 
And we've yep. run an hour and 11 minutes, so you've been very generous with your time. I've got one question from earlier on in the room to ask you, going back to our original conversation about VPNs, Fiona was asking, is there a particular provider of VPNs that you rate, or is there a shortlist you like, or is it all the same? I would go for, um, it, it constantly changes. I would go for, uh, I'd have a look at reviews, if I was looking at one. Uh, I use one that's called hide.me um, purely because it gives me the ability from a security point of view uh, to when I'm testing things to sort of use a different server that uh, would necessarily log, but it's a bit more overkill for what a, a typical person would use. Um, it, it was quite good. I had a, a client of mine that I let use one of my logins because they went to China and therefore they needed to access the internet, their own personal use. But with all the China restrictions, it really allowed them to bypass it. Um, but for a general user, I would probably, and most of your antivirus providers will have some sort of VPN. I know McAfee does. I know that uh, Norton does. The um, there's, there's various ones out there. And I, I wouldn't say that it, it's, it's about ones that you have as a rep that you could go. I've heard of them. They're a well-known brand, and there's people that recommended them. But otherwise, do um, type into Google VPN 2018 reviews. And if it comes to next year, VPN 2019 reviews. Uh, if you're you watching might... this on me, Clay, those went up a sticky post earlier on in the conversation. But I just wanted to get back to find out what, what you thought, Tristan. Uh, it, it would always yeah. come down to who you're comfortable with. I mean, if I, would, I, I personally do not uh, rate the McAfee software. But again, I don't like using it, and I've experienced more problems with it than if I was buying one off the shelf, it would be Norton. Uh, the, the best one that seems to get rated highly that I've come across is Kaspersky for antivirus. But in my personal opinion, the Kaspersky user interface is terrible that if I was giving it to a user to use, they would not be able to make any changes it would really be difficult to use you'd have to sort of have blind faith it was doing everything and never ever want to change any setting whereas that's why i used to favor sort of norton when i was dealing with an off-the-shelf sort of product um it's all down to personal taste who do you like who have you been using who have you who do you have that faith in uh but again they're all a much of a muchness norton mcafee they they have a reputation to protect so therefore their networks are going to be safe and secure they've got to be because as soon as one wasn't they would just fall out of the market completely but if you do a, a search on the internet find one and usually they'll give you a free trial then they they may do that this is the way they'll tend to do it they'll either give you a free trial for so many days or they will give you a free trial on a put down service. So in other words, you'll be limited on the speed you can have. Um, try it. Do you like it? Is it easy to use? Uh, I was setting up one person's VPN. I can't remember who it was, but it was from a coffee collapse group. And we tried to set it up the more technical way and it didn't quite work. We used their app to do it. It worked quite well. So actually for a user point of view, download the software and double click on it each time you want to run it it actually was really good and simple to use i think that was called viber um as a yeah, as a vpn i'm an advanced person because i found that really easy but that doesn't yep. mean it's better yep. but um it, it, but again, it's, easy it's going to, to be use, much yeah. muchness because they've got to keep their reputation if they if their reputation dropped every other because there's so many out there they would just be swamped straight over. Well, one of the things I've noticed, though, I'm, I'm not competent to judge them technically, you know, but I think it's worthwhile shopping around amongst the big names um, but for what their multi-device prices are because yeah. some are much better value if you're using three or five devices. And obviously, it's hardly any point having a VPN on your laptop if it's not on your phone. Also, iPad, you know, you've got also to... be aware that the, the multi device licenses they're often about how many devices at once, yeah. Are being... So, in so, other words, uh, if you have, if you have one device, yeah. so it, it could be that you decide whenever I'm going out, I'm always going to be using my iPad to do work and never my laptop, so therefore, you only ever need your, your iPad on. 
but it might but if you are going to have your laptop and your ipad out and connecting to a public wi-fi then you would need a two device because you're connected to two devices simultaneously through that vpn yeah. I'm, I'm often connected to two devices simultaneously because I get bored when I wait for stuff, so I go on the other one while I'm waiting for the results of a search on one and do I, something else. Well, well, one has come up with a question I hadn't thought yeah. about, though, in relation to VPNs. She said, don't we have challenges with Kaspersky because they're outside Europe? No. Now, no. I'm, I'm aware of there being an issue about that, but can you fill me in? This, this was the confusion we, we saw in the coffee clutch on the run-up to GDPR. Uh, most manufacturers of software outside Europe we we have a very low level the, the reason the government's put so much money into research and development uh, tax benefit is because we've lost pretty much everything single part of software development in this country we used to have we were used to be world leaders i mean the internet was two americans and one brit they needed to get over there to create the whole infrastructure network uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, those two Americans, and it was American funded, which is why it's all spelt in American when you do web programming. But everywhere else builds it. McAfee uh, and Norton and all the others, they're international companies. They do not hold your data. They do not collect your data. They will they will collect you as a transaction. So they, the data they hold about you is your name, your, your address, because of them billing you because you're buying a service of them. They don't have any of the data on your computer. They, the software scans it. The software scans it not to read what content is there, but for signatures. So viruses have signatures to them, which is how the code is written. So it looks for those sort of snippets of code. It looks for those access codes. But it doesn't read your data. It doesn't store your data. So there's absolutely nothing to do. The, the software may have been made in, let's say, with Kaspersky. It's made in Russia. But one, they sell in the UK, so they have a UK office, so they have to abide by GDPR for the UK office. It's a bit like with Amazon. There's Amazon UK, there's Amazon America, there's Amazon France. They're all separate companies. So for Kaspersky to be sold inside Europe, it, they have a European office. But they're also, the software doesn't collect your data. They're not storing it. Well, Cambridge Analytics had a Cambridge office, but it didn't stop them hacking our data, did it? Oh, so then, I, I don't have your charming faith that just being a reputable brand or just being located in one place is good enough. So I'm much more the, cynical than you. Yeah. What you find with the Cambridge Analytics and things like that is they still acted against the law. So or they acted against or depending on where they were based of what the particular rules were. The 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 fact you've got of that is you could still have a uk company that will still look at your data um mm. if you but at that point that's not you giving the data breach that's them giving the data breach uh because they they're the ones who have lied to you because it's and they've broken the law uh the you can you can always have that to, it, you you can't stop a thief coming into your house you know, it's that sort of somewhat your door locks are designed to make it difficult, but if someone's determined enough, there is no door lock in existence that will stop someone breaking in. Um, and the, the locks make it harder. So, so is there a kind of firewall equivalent of a very large dog then? <laughs> it, it, again, it comes down to the reputation wise, because if a company does it and they are they are ever discovered as so, they, the reputation they lose, they would just completely crush out the market. Uh, it's one of the reasons. After Google, they get my data, though, isn't it? it Angela's saying deviance will always be devious. I thought you were going for a walk on the beach, Angela, but um, if yeah, they, if so much, was right, Cambridge was a small company. Yeah. So the big players, you feel, are more trustworthy. But it, it's not just that. It's it's a, it's a reputation part. It's um, I mean, if you look at, let's say, for instance, with the, the VAs, the, your your VAs may represent several companies, and they may represent several companies that are the same. Now they've got terms of agreement between them and those companies. So let's say they look after two IT companies. They have terms and conditions that will protect those IT companies with the data they hold. But there's still nothing to technically stop them swapping that data and saying, "Oh, well, I like you more. So actually, that call that came in, I'm going to give to you instead of sending it to the place that they, they actually called." There's nothing to technically stop them because who's going to know? The trouble is, if they get found out, their reputation's gone so much they'll be out of business because who would ever use someone who did that? 
So, and it's the same thing with any of the, the big companies out there. Who would use them if they did that? The part of the analytics, yes, they were a bit more in depth about what they use. Yes, there were certain things, but it's the fine lines of what they walked over. Whereas when you've got the um, your your antivirus, the software is running on your computer. It updates what's on your computer, but it's not sending the data out. Because if it was sending the data from your computer out there, there's so many people out there that monitor these types of software, they'd already know that it was happening. Because you can, you, if you're a geeky enough, that it's software you can put on your computer that monitors every bit of transactional data that goes from your computer out to the internet and where it goes on the internet. Um, this wow. is where Microsoft, when you've got uh, when you turn on those settings of like the Katana and things like that, they you know they see where the data actually goes and flows. From a GDPR point of view, using a, a software developer that's outside the UK is not an issue um, at all because the software is running on your computer inside the UK. It's all about where's your data being transferred to, the data you hold. If it was being sent to Kaspersky's servers. For them to process and send send back to you, then yes, there could be a problem. But it's not. The antivirus is run on your computer, and Kaspersky send you updates to your antivirus. Because again, if if that wasn't allowed, take Microsoft, Apple, you wouldn't be able to use a computer, you wouldn't be able to use a phone, Google, all of those devices are created by companies that are actually American based. Uh, Facebook is American based. Yet yeah, you type your data and you will communicate with people. Um, you know, you send a text message through the telephone company. It's all transmitted. And even actually, if you are emailing from Scotland down to London, your data may well go across the Atlantic into America before it comes back into London. WWW. I, I think when I message my husband when we're working via Facebook Messenger or in adjoining rooms, I figured it out once that half the time my message is going via somewhere in the Midwest, even though I could get up and speak to him. But being a tech kind of girl, I message him, so put the kettle on. You know? Well, the, the, well yeah, the, the internet used to be called the World Wide Wait. And the whole reason it was is because the data could well be going to the other side of the world before it comes back, even though in a straight line, um, there is a huge network uh, which the university is all connected to. It's called the Janet Network, um, which runs throughout the UK. And that is a big sort of, if you imagine the, your internet connections are like a huge uh, pipe, uh, like a sewage pipe. So you've got like the main pipe that's going throughout the UK. And then you've got your streets that are on a bigger pipe that connect to it. And then your houses are on a smaller pipe that connect to the street pipe, which is where you share your internet to a certain degree that, if uh, everybody's using the internet at the same time, your speeds will slow down. So it, that's that big network goes throughout the UK. Your data can still go all the way over to America before it comes back. So that means it has passed through American computers. And you have no control over that because you can't control where the data is routed. Because the whole point of it is that one computer can go down, but the whole network, the whole communication structure stays there, which is why when that phishing trawler severed the uh, transatlantic link your data was not only you know we weren't talking about america to uk communication our data if we were talking to america would go down to south america south africa or go to africa sorry that can and then all across to south america before going back up or it might have gone across to russia through to japan and the other way around to america so it could go all over the place we live in a global data world, don't we? Whether yeah. we think so or not. Yeah. So you can never. Now, Tristan, I'm going to have to wrap it up. I love listening to you. Please come back to us and explain absolutely. to us more things we absolutely didn't understand. Because the only way we're ever going to get on top of securing our data is if you tell us how these things really work. Because we're lost in the jargon and the acronyms, and yeah. I think of them as the false prophets of. GDPR and cyber security who tell us you've got to spend a lot of money on this and you've got to do that and you've got to have that and nobody seems to even know what they are never mind why we should need them and I'm so grateful to you Tristan for clarifying this there are brief moments when I think I understand this stuff and they are only ever when I'm listening to you but as soon as you stop talking I'll get confused yep. again so please come back in our groups uh, Tristan's absolutely. a member of all our GDPR groups tag him if you've got a question yeah, you can absolutely see always happy to 
really no sister and if you need someone to help you with your tech Tristan obviously and demonstrably speaks English as well as techie which is and you don't meet very many bilingual techies do you I know that because half the time I speak tech people I have no idea what we're talking about I always like to try and keep it easy and manage well it's a teacher background so. <laughs> well done you I hope you'll be back with us soon if you've got more tech questions for Tristan let us know in the group and I'll try and twist his arm and get him back again to do something else if you missed the early ones there was encrypting your devices um, we started with laptops we went through phones didn't we they're still in the file section tell us what you want Kristen to tell us about I'm getting increasingly confused about setting controls in my browser about cookies um, I'm not getting any cookies. There has not been any chocolate chip for me for ages now. So um, maybe you could think about that another time, Tristan, because yep. the psycho battle of that is just too much, isn't it? Yep. Um, so nice. take care and stay secure. And Tristan, thank you, my lovely. You're more than welcome. Thank you. <laughs>